how beautiful it is to be in the company of saints. Thank you all. Well, good morning again. Good morning. I was just thinking back a couple of years ago, um, Alice and I went to a place that I had been wanting to go for decades. We finally got a chance to go to the Biltmore House in Asheville, North Carolina. Now, it's a place I'd always wanted to go for two reasons. First of all, obviously, it's one of the most spectacular places in the country or in the world even. Uh, and it's something very special to see any time of year. But second, and more importantly for me, I actually had a family connection to the Biltmore House. See, my grandfather grew up in Italy, and he was a master craftsman with stone and marble and tile. And he was one of hundreds that were brought over to work on the Biltmore House. And... Uh, so I wanted to go see the craftsmanship. And as we were walking through this magnificent place, every room there was something that was carved out of marble or stone or there was some elaborate tile work. And I would think to myself, I wonder if he did that. I wonder if that was his work. And it was really special to know that our family had a connection to something so wonderful. And I, I felt a special connection to him uh, as I walked through there. And it felt really good to know that our family had a special part in that place. And I share that with you today because today is a day that we celebrate and observe something very similar in the church, uh, All Saints Day, as I mentioned earlier. And I we have a scripture today that I'd like to uh, read with you, and I invite you to stand as you're able as we read together from Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, and I'm reading from the English Standard Version, and um, just a little context, Hebrews is a bit of a mystery. We don't know really who wrote it. Several people are considered possible authors. There's no real definitive author of Hebrews, but we do know that it was written to the early church, the Hebrew Christians, the Jewish Christians, who uh, were fairly new to the faith and undergoing persecution. And the purpose of Hebrews was to remind them of the heroes of their faith, especially in this part of it. And so in chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, we read, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you be seated again, please? Now, my, you probably noticed I took my watch off, and somebody said, well, what does that mean? Nothing. Not a thing. <laughs> we're, we're here until it's done. Um, uh, just kidding. It's a short sermon today. Can I get an amen? Okay. Amen. I know. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Jack. That's enough. <laughs> All righty. Now, this scripture talks to us about the saints. And um, my experience at the Biltmore House, remembering my grandfather in that way, uh, is kind of a similar situation when we talk about the communion of saints that we say every week in the Apostles' Creed. And perhaps you've wondered, what does it mean, the communion of saints? And 
uh, we tend to think of saints. How many of y'all have a Catholic background? I know several of you do. Um, I do too, actually, in my childhood. My father was Catholic. You know, we, we heard a lot about the saints. And uh, in the Catholic Church, it's a whole different way of looking at things. The saints are venerated. Uh, it's a big, big deal to be a saint in the Catholic Church. And uh, when someone is, is given sainthood, and, and in our lifetime, you've seen that happen several times, uh, probably most recently would it be Mother Teresa, uh, was probably the last one who's venerated. Um, we think of people like that, or Francis of Assisi, or any of the other many saints. And then when we also think of communion, we tend to think of it as the Lord's Supper. Um, and both of those are right. The saints are those who are venerated, and communion is represented by the bread and the, the juice. But the notion of the communion of saints is much bigger, broader idea than either one of those two things. I'd say that the, the notion of the communion of saints that we refer to is very much uh, the individual version of the body of Christ. And, and let me explain that to you. We talk about the Holy Catholic Church. Now, this is a whole different Catholic that we're talking about in the Apostles' Creed, and we've talked about it, the Catholic with the, uh, the little c. The body of Christ is called the Catholic Church. The communion of saints, then, represents the body of Christ. So it's not the Roman Catholic Church that we're talking about in the Creed. It is the Holy Catholic Church, which basically means the body of Christ, or the church universal. So we include in the body of Christ, or the universal church, any and all churches who believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. One church, one universal body of believers, as we say, one holy and Catholic Church. And the communion of saints takes that concept and I think brings it down more to an individual level because this, the word saint, as it's used in the New Testament, especially by Paul, adopts the meaning uh, from the, the creed there. Paul writes to the saints in different churches. If you've ever looked at the foreword of many of Paul's letter to the different churches, he's writing to the saints in this church or the saints in this location and what he's basically saying is he's writing to the believers to those who claim Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior now I don't know about you but it is hard for me to think of myself as a saint because I know me and I know some of y'all and it's hard for me to think of y'all in that way too but but Paul uses this term broadly to talk about those who accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, who have professed their belief in Him. And so he refers to them and to us as saints. And so let me just be the first one to say this morning, hello, saints. <laughs> and uh, where is the, uh, those New Orleans fans? This is not you I'm talking about. <laughs> And so communion is what we call it when we gather together for the Lord's Supper, but it also means more than that. Just like saints has a different meaning, the whole reason that we call the celebration of the Lord's Supper communion is because of what we believe we are doing at that moment. Now, we're doing a couple of things. First of all, we're sharing this with one another here. And so we are in the moment communing and fellowshipping with each other and with God. Because we share from the same loaf, we share from the same cup, and we take the same food and cup that everyone else takes, and we also say that it's from the same source, that it represents the body and the blood of Christ. And because of that, we are all nourished by the same Holy Spirit. And that is what we believe happens in Holy Communion. We are nourished by the Spirit through these elements. And so, something else you may have noticed when we celebrate communion here in this church and most Methodist churches around the world, no one is excluded. Uh, the smallest child, those who belong to other faith traditions, even those who have no faith tradition at all, 
are welcome at the Lord's table, and we'll be issuing that invitation in just a few minutes here when we celebrate together. Because we open up the table to affirm this is how we find unity in our relationship with Jesus. Jesus never turned anyone away, and so uh, we also don't turn anyone away from the Lord's table. When we say in the Apostles' Creed, then, as we said just a few moments ago, that we believe in the communion of saints, we are affirming what we do here at the Lord's table, but we're also recognizing that communion is much bigger than that. It's like, again, the Holy Catholic Church, the big body of believers. Uh, if you're familiar with uh, a theologian named Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Bonhoeffer, if you ever go to seminary, trust me, you'll know Bonhoeffer. Uh, but Bonhoeffer said something really interesting about this concept. He said that unity with our Christian brothers and sisters, that's us, it's not an ideal that we strive for, but it's a reality that we participate in. In other words, it's not something that we can control. It's something that's real. And when we celebrate communion here, we're celebrating it with everybody all over the world at the same time, the body of believers. And we're celebrating it with them as they did then, as they do now, and as they will do it for all time. And I, I want you to think of it kind of like this. And this is kind of a weird concept, and, and I kind of struggled to put this together. I said, how would I understand this? Uh, and, and it came to me that once we accept Christ as Lord, it's like you're connected to him with this invisible cord. And that means all of us have this cord that is connected to the same source. We're all plugged into the same vine, if you will, from that scripture in Matthew. And that means that we're all connected and related, in a sense, just like those on your family tree, like I was with my grandfather and generations before. We're all in communion with one another because of our connection to Jesus Christ. We may be very different, and we are. We may disagree about some things, and we do, and we may not even like each other, and sometimes we don't, and that's too bad, <laughs> because we're in communion together if we are in Christ. We are family, and that's what families do. They don't always agree, but they are connected, and they can't control that connection. It is what it is, and so when we say... I believe in the communion of saints that we say every week. We're saying that we believe in the power of community of believers, and we believe that that will strengthen our faith. It means that together we can kind of face anything, and we have. Over the centuries, the church has undergone a great deal of persecution and transition and changes, and the church is still very much alive and well. We are Christians together. But in this passage that we just read from Hebrews, it's bigger than even this. You see, the great cloud of witnesses that the author of Hebrews is talking about, if you went back a chapter before, in chapter 11, that's basically the chapter of the heroes of our faith. Chapter 11, if you haven't read chapter 11 of Hebrews, I encourage you to do it. Heck, pull out a Bible now. It won't offend me. Just uh, read it. And it's all the heroes of the faith that they were pointing to, to these persecuted Hebrew Christians to say, now, remember these faithful ser servants. Remember Abel and Enoch and Noah and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and Moses and Rahab and many others. Chapter 11 is like the greatest hits, the heroes of our faith from the beginning up through the time that that was written. And so the author of Hebrews wanted to encourage those Christians by saying, look at this cloud of witnesses. Look at this list of heroes who were faithful to God and on whose shoulders we stand today. That was the purpose of this writing. And so the whole purpose of reminding these folks of this is to give them strength, to give them hope. The communion of saints, then, gives us strength and hope. 
it's like we can stand on their shoulders too. And, and I was I was kind of as I talked about the Biltmore House, I had I haven't been that proud of my family history for some time. But just knowing that something that wonderful that we had a small part in that just made me so proud. And so today in the church, knowing that the those that we rang the bell for today and those that have gone before them, we're standing on their shoulders. They were such a big part of building this place and the church even beyond that. We're connected to that cloud of witnesses. Now, the blood of my ancestors, all of our ancestors, the blood of our ancestors has been diluted over time. You might be related to Charlemagne. I don't know. But that blood isn't as strong today. It's been diluted over the centuries. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I probably have some real famous relative. Uh, I, I was <laughs> watching a movie the other day. And, and, and the guy wanted to surprise his girlfriend, so he took her to Ellis Island, and he wanted to show her how much he cared. So he had had them research and go all the way back to when her ancestors came to this country through Ellis Island, and one of them was called the Butcher of Bakersfield. And she figured that was his trade. And come to find out, he was a mass murderer, and uh, so she didn't really want to know about that. And I don't know why I said that. It just seemed funny at the time. Uh, but... But we all have that in our family tree somewhere, uh, whether they're you know real butchers or not. Um, but just think back to the cloud of witnesses in your life, and um, they're all special. But we're talking about the blood, you know, the, the the blood of the generations diluted. That connection to Jesus Christ, none of that blood is diluted. It still is strong today, as it was when he spilled the blood for us on the cross. And that's what connects us. We are all connected by that same blood. And as we think back to the heroes in our faith, uh, whether it be parents or grandparents or dear friends, whoever it was, perhaps a teacher that helped you find your way, whatever it is, when you remember the saints from your life as I talk to the children when I look at the pictures of my parents I still miss them very much even after 30 years and I know many of you that wound is even more fresh uh, who have lost saints in your life more recently and sometimes you can look at those pictures and have those memories and you physically ache to be with them again you know what I mean I know I know many of you feel that that desire is not unique to us today. In fact, Paul wrote about this to the church at Thessalonica. Uh, in 1 Thessalonians 4, he writes, he wants to encourage them that those who have been martyred, those who they've lost in the faith, that they, they will see them again. He says, brothers, we don't want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep, and that was how he said die, uh, or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep or died in Him. And what I take from that is that as much as I miss my parents and other loved ones that have gone before, those whose hope and faith was in Christ, we will be reunited. Now, I don't know if they're going to look this young. I don't know if they're going to look like they did when they died, I don't know what they're going to look like. But I feel sure that we will recognize one another and rejoice in the reunion. And, and I think we all have that hope for those who are in Christ. The communion of saints is one of the most beautiful ideas in Christian theology. And that means that you and I, the saints who are becoming saints here on earth, and those who are fully sanctified, saints in heaven, that we still commune together. And when you come forward today to receive Holy Communion, I don't want you to think about it as, well, it's just an obligation. Everybody else is doing it, so I'm coming up. Uh, if that's how you're feeling, you should probably just stay seated. Uh, 
But when we come forward and receive communion, it is to be refreshed and renewed in our spirits today, but also to commune with those who have gone before us. This is a time when the whole body of Christ now and then comes together. And that is the mystery that is represented in this holy meal. One body, one holy Catholic church, serving one Lord in communion with one another, then, now, and forever. Let us pray. Father God, we bless your holy name today, and we thank you for all of your many servants who, now that they've finished their course, they've run their course, that they rest from their labors. Father, give us grace to follow the example of their faithfulness to your honor and glory through Christ our Lord. Amen.